summer Davos in Dalian is how we are in really a two-speed world. Two speeds of development, two speeds of slowdown, there will probably be two speeds of recovery. And the only place where there are going to be a fast speed is going to be in the emerging world, emerging economies. So much attention has been focused on the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China. But we all know that the next 30 years will not be like the past 30 years. We all know that the BRICS themselves are reaching maturity. And so in the search for speed, the search for development, the search for investment opportunities, we have to look elsewhere. We have to look to frontier markets. We have to look to new markets. The purpose of this session is to delve into those new markets, to think about those frontiers. We've got a great panel here today, and I hope that during the next hour we'll be able to think about some themes, some of the key themes, I think. First definition, what countries should we be including in this list of frontier markets? What regions? How do we look at the countries to include them in this frontier or not? What are the lessons that we've learned from the BRIC experience? What are the lessons for the countries themselves about regulation, about openness, about market participation, about protectionism? What are the lessons for companies as they want to participate in this remarkable growth? How do companies succeed? whether they be foreign companies or domestic companies. How do they succeed within these frontier markets as they experience dramatic growth? What, are, what happens with early penetration of the market? What are the opportunities and risks for being first movers? What are the key policy measures that are needed in terms of rule of law, strengthening institutions, fighting corruption, liquidity in the market, and creating an overall positive environment for investment? And finally, how do we ensure long-term healthy growth? How do we ensure that some of the benefits of this growth, most of the benefits of this growth, remain at home with the host and don't just escape abroad? So to, to discuss these issues, we've got a great panel. We've got uh, Leo Liango, who is Vice President of the Export-Import Bank of China, who's also had experience with the ADB, particularly during the Asian financial crisis. Uh, we've got uh, Khalid uh, bin, uh, bin, bin Bandar bin Sultan, who, who is the chairman of Daim Holdings. We've got Dahengir Hajiev, who is chairman of the board of the International Bank of Azerbaijan. We've got Nguyen Kam Tu, who is the deputy minister of industry and trade of Vietnam. And we've got Turan Khanna, who is a Jorge Paulo Lehman professor at Harvard Business School, and who has written the book on how to succeed in emerging markets. And since he's written the book, I think he should start and give us a few words of wisdom to set the context of this discussion. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. Yes. It seems to be the pattern of the day is to get the professor first. <laughs> that's my third panel that starts with me. Um, but I'm very pleased to, pleased to be here and pleased to participate in this, uh, in this uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful discussion. Um, I guess uh, I'm, I'm going to pick up on a particular question that you asked, which is um, what is it that we've learned from the BRIC experience and the emerging market stories that have uh, saturated the, uh, the airwaves and the print media and so on for the last uh, perhaps 20 years in many ways and, and even longer. I think I'd say that the, uh, the first thing that we've learned, in my view, is that there are many different ways to skin the cat. Uh, in other words, there are many different models that seem to work. Uh, they do have something in common, which is if you take the term emerging market seriously, uh, what it really implies is that ways of bringing buyers and sellers together are improving. That it's possible for people to come together to transact, to buy simple things, to consume, to invest, to hire uh, talent, to uh, uh, go places, uh, whatever, whatever activity they wish to do, it's becoming easier and easier to do it. Uh, and that's, that's the definition of a market. A market is something that just brings buyers and sellers together. And emerging, of course, means literally that, that it's something that didn't exist before, is coming into being, is therefore facilitating economic activity. Uh, and if you apply that very simple yet powerful definition, um, almost every market is, has a bit of an emerging market buried inside it. Uh, and I think what you learn, and right there, just, just from the BRIC countries, you learn that there are many different ways to, to, to make this work. 
Um, I like to contrast uh, China and India because to me in many different ways they are the uh, mirror images of each other, the inverse of each other. What China is good at, India tends to be pretty bad at. What India is good at, China is also pretty bad at. Um, and uh, in a sense, you know, starting from roughly the same time, late 1940s in both countries' histories, they went on completely opposite paths. Yet in some ways they've had some successes um, along the way. Um, you know, China has, as, uh, as a quick, uh, quick look outside as you come up to this convention center, will convince you as just spectacular infrastructure, um, just unbelievable infrastructure in a very short period of time. Uh, and India, um, uh, embarrassingly, uh, couldn't hold a candle to this, uh, continue to, to do this. India is my country of origin, so I find it somewhat embarrassing. Um, on the other hand, I think in, India has uh, done a much better job than China at nurturing the soft infrastructure of development, um, uh, perhaps rule of law, perhaps property rights, intellectual property rights, things of that nature. So you see a much higher concentration of knowledge intensive industries in India. So both these are paths to development, uh, and it's a little hard to rank one better than the other. Uh, and I could debate you ad nauseum about whatever your persuasion is. I'll argue the converse uh, indefinitely. Um, and I think the, the, uh, the point is that um, depending on your priorities and which you wish to put first, um, it's, um, uh, they, both, they both are models of work. And then you move on to the Brazils of the world that are flush with commodity uh, riches, um, or, the, uh, or the Nigerias or South Africas of the world, Indonesias perhaps. Um, and they're following a very different model. It's a little bit of a hybrid of the China and the, in the India models in some abstract way of thinking. Uh, and it also works, and in some ways is even healthier than the China and the India model. So that's the first point I would say, that there are many different ways to make it work. And it's incumbent upon all the countries represented on the panel as well as anywhere else to ask what are the fundamental strengths of their own country's model uh, as opposed to trying to uh, put it in a, in a pre-existing box of the United States or Europe or some other, some other BRIC country. Uh, the second point is that uh, there are some other confounding variables that make it hard to rank these countries unambiguously. And in particular, I want to highlight the role of demography. Um, and to illustrate this, I'll go back to the China-India comparison. India, in some sense, in the next, uh, next generation, next quarter century, is going to go through the same demographic transition that China has just almost completed. In other words, the ratio of working age, non-working age population is going to rise in India in the way that it rose and plateaued in China and is now going to fall in China. Uh, some demographers say that uh, if, you, if you accept that China has grown at roughly 10% for a long time, 10% uh, annual growth rate for a long time, that a good 3 to 4% of that 10% is accounted for by a very favorable aid structure. And uh, that, that is now lost to it as China, as China uh, ages. Um, so it, it confounds the evaluation of policies that are not already set in stone. And demography is something that's set in stone because our, our, our demographic futures for the next 25 years have already been determined by our actions in the past. Uh, so I would highlight the role of demography in, in uh, being careful about evaluating whatever models different BRIC countries and others are pursuing. And the last thing I would say, and uh, this is more targeted to uh, my, uh, my adopted country, the United States, uh, and the developed world, is, is for those of us who live in the developed world not to make the mistake uh, of assuming that uh, emerging market equals uh, uh, poor technology and things like that. Of course, there is, uh, by and large, much more poverty in the emerging markets than there is in the developed world, almost definitionally. Uh, but there are plenty of pockets of excellence and plenty of examples of leapfrogging that are going on. Uh, and in some sense, I prefer to think of each environment, whether it's the United States or China or Brazil or India or what have you, as being its own specific development petri dish, its own specific development uh, center for innovation, where the particular things that come out of that country are those that are best suited to the problems of that country. And when you begin to use that lens to look at things, what you realize is that there are interesting things that every society can contribute to the rest of the world. Right? Um, uh, and I can use some, I'm sure, some, I'm sure we have some examples of that as we go along, but let me cede the floor back to you, David, so we hear from others. Fantastic, thanks, I think that's a great introduction. But one of the things, when you look at Brazil, Russia, India, China, of course, they all have huge scale. So I, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Hedjiv, uh, when you, uh, a country like uh, Azerbaijan, or, or Vietnam, or uh, in Ecuador, or Chile, how, how do you think they should look at their big neighbors, and how should countries and companies wanting to invest in you look at the region as opposed to a specific country? 
<coughs> Thank you, David. You know, uh, when we uh, look at uh, big countries, of course, it's uh, one of the biggest countries and one of the biggest economies in the world, maybe 50% uh, of 50% uh, of uh, the global uh, market. But uh, I think uh, one had one has to take a look at uh, what. Uh, what uh, treats out of these countries, I mean, uh, Brazil, uh, Russia, and uh, China, and India, uh, what, uh, what these countries just surrounded by, which, uh, which countries, I mean, it, and uh, which blocks and treaties uh, and uh, uh, trade and economic treaties they are part of. Let's say uh, Russia, Russia is, uh, and Russia and, Azer and Azerbaijan used to be in, in one country as a uh, Soviet Union, and uh, after the collapse of Soviet Union, we are still in, in the CIS and Commonwealth of Independent uh, States, and uh, at, at, on one side. On another side, on another side uh, uh, Russia has uh, a treaty uh, with, uh, with um, customs treaty with uh, Belarus and uh, with uh, Kazakhstan, and uh, such a small country uh, as, as Azerbaijan, maybe uh, small, but uh, you know, with uh, the uh, fastest growing economy uh, on the uh, on the uh, roads between north and uh, south, east and west, and uh, with, uh, with uh, big uh, big. Uh, uh, oil and gas uh, reserves uh, could be just example of how gets, uh, one can penetrate just uh, markets, uh, BRICS uh, markets, and maybe just to gain to gain experience in in one country in uh, in uh, countries such as Azerbaijan and uh, others, that's uh, Georgia and others, just uh, which uh, used to share the uh, common uh, common uh, traditions uh, account uh, still uh, which uh, which have which has. Uh, Strong economic ties with uh, these uh, countries, and just first, just to penetrate uh, this, uh, these uh, uh, countries, uh, then just uh, to uh, go ahead with such uh, big, huge uh, mar uh, markets as, uh, let's say, in this part of the world, is uh, Russia uh, and uh, China and in India, India itself. I can uh, give uh, many uh, good examples of uh, doing uh, doing this, and uh, and uh, you know uh, you know that Azerbaijan we have out of uh, seven uh, oil and uh, gas pipelines we have Baku Tbilisi uh, which connect uh, oil reserves and oil and gas reserves of Caspian Caspian uh, Sea basin uh, to uh, to uh, Europe and to uh, rest of the rest of the world and connecting the same uh, uh, Kazakhstan and maybe China to this uh, route and maybe in the future I mean uh, uh, if uh, such project as Nabucco will uh, realized will be realized and uh, at the same time uh, there is construction of uh, Baku uh, Baku uh, Tbilisi Kars uh, Akhalkalaki railroad will connect which will restore the route from so called uh, silk road silk way from uh, from China through uh, Kazakhstan uh, through Azerbaijan and uh, Russia and uh, to uh, to Europe so there is a lot of opportunities and um, I think uh, one has again the uh, to explore the situation and uh, possibilities uh, within uh, around the uh, BRIC countries, just in order just to penetrate uh, BRIC countries uh, market. Right. Thank you, uh, Vice Minister. Too, I'd, I'd like to turn to you. What is it like to be in the government of a frontier market? What are the policies that you think that you need to put in place, especially learning from the uh, the BRIC experience? Uh, maybe let me uh, go a little bit broader than that. Uh, you have talked uh, a lot uh, at the interior uh, point of view about uh, the frontier market, emerging market. So let me uh, try to, uh, to talk uh, about that uh, more practical from the exam uh, of our country. Yeah. So uh, what is Vietnam? Vietnam is now it's a quite small uh, economy which uh, uh, newly uh, developing, you know that our country started to open to the outside world only uh, 25 years ago by uh, by our innovation policy, well known around the world as Doi Mới. And today, uh, <coughs> Vietnam is still at very low rate of development, low level of development. Only in 2010, we uh, escaped the the status of a poor country and join uh, the group of uh, medium income countries by the UN uh, standard. But nevertheless, uh, the Vietnam is uh, widely classified as a, a potential country. 
we are uh, was included in the group of countries uh, with high potential like uh, next 11 or uh, sea west for example and uh, you are classified as a frontier market by the different uh, organizations for example uh, the Morgan Stanley Capital International list uh, as of May 2009, or uh, 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 FTSE list as uh, September 2010, or recently uh, Standard and Poor Frontier Broad Market Index as of April 2011. So, what is uh, what is uh, the reason of that? I think what is characteristic uh, they take to, to to classify Vietnam like that. I think that uh, there are a number of uh, uh, number of things talk about that. Uh, firstly, I think that our country is a medium-sized country with a, a quite a high population, with 90 billion, a million people, which is the 13th largest popula populated country in the world, just after the Japan and Mexico. And uh, more than that, uh, we are now at the golden age of population, which means that. 66% of uh, population is in the working age and with a, a high rate of literacy, more than 95% is the first thing, I think. The second thing is that uh, our country has uh, 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 a lot of uh, resources. Uh, take, for example, Vietnam is now it's the, first, uh, it's the third largest uh, producer of natural rubber. The third uh, in the world, the third is uh, producer of oil in the Asia. The, se the second largest producer of coal in, the, in Asia, for example. And uh, beside that, I think that uh, uh, our, our country has a, a very high uh, rate of growth, mm -hmm. which is uh, average uh, during the 25 years, the average rate was about 7.5%, uh, which uh, the second after the China at 9%. Even during the three difficult years of two, from 2008 to 2010, the rate was still keep us at 6.5%, which is uh, the third after the India, uh, after China and India. And projected for next year, uh, for example, HSBC project for 2012, our rate is about 7.5 or 12.1%. It's, it's for, for comparing, it's 15% uh, higher than for the rest of Asia. Uh, and what is higher uh, behind that higher uh, rate of growth? I think that there are some things. Firstly, it's, uh, it's uh, the economical policy of the government. Mm -hmm. so, so I take one example. Uh, even uh, uh, Vietnam is newly uh, uh, developing country. But uh, uh, we are very open to the outside uh, economical world. And now uh, our combined number of input export uh, equal to 176 uh, percent of our GDP. Mm -hmm. Or from the other side, we are uh, uh, actively integrating in the world region in the world market. We are now a member of WTO, ASEAN, uh, APEC, ASEAN. We have a, a, a number of FTA with uh, different uh, countries, uh, including uh, United States, EU, and uh, Russia, for example, and so on. And the second thing that uh, the government pay a, a lot of attention to uh, to build a full constitutional uh, uh, legal system, include the, the legal system for which regulating uh, the investment. Uh, for example, now Vietnam has a, uh, a common investment law, which not, uh, make not differences between uh, the sources of capital, even uh, domestic or in, uh, foreign, and uh, make uh, foreigners be uh, safe uh, do, uh, doing a business in our country. And the third thing I think that <coughs> behind that that growth is that. Uh, 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 the government put a uh, 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 big attention about administrative uh, reform. Uh, you have a long-term uh, long uh, national program for administrative reform, which uh, uh, reduce 
uh, red tape and, uh, and uh, make uh, an easier procedures for the investment in our country. And the one more thing I think that it's uh, Gavan pay uh, attention about uh, putting a lot of money to develop uh, uh, <coughs> infrastructure mm -hmm. and training uh, labor forces for investment. I think all that hiding behind the, the high rate of the development. And I think that that is characteristic of the frontier emerging market. Thank you. So, so the openness, the legal system, the reform, and the infrastructure. Good points. So Khalid, when you look for investment opportunities, what are the key things that you look for in the, uh, in the frontier markets? Um, very simply, stability. Mm -hmm. um, you know, without stability, and following on from that, obviously, sus sustainability. Uh, those are the two most important things, and you know, not just being Saudi, but all of our investments as a as a private company are in Saudi Arabia. And um, some people call me a bit of a lunatic, obviously, as a result. It's not the uh, the most fun neighborhood to be in sometimes uh, politically. It's um, it's a harsh climate. Um, I always like in Saudi Arabia, if it, it sort of explain to people the, the issues we're going through as a nation, it's incredibly wealthy, no question, but uh, Saudi Arabia is a country that won the lottery. Um, I don't know many uh, CEOs and chairmen of companies who started off with a lottery win. Um, the, 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 the building up of something is, is usually concrete, hard work, long term, uh, vision, experience, etc. We, we were a very poor nation, found ourselves with a lot of wealth, and we've been developing, trying to develop ever since. Um, that's a bit harsh. There's a lot in Saudi Arabia that is not just a, a lottery winner. Um, but the, the key thing for us is developing industries outside of, of um, oil and gas and the petroleum industry. We're trying very hard to develop into petrochemicals, which is wonderful, but it still goes back to the, the initial thing. So uh, I suppose in a nutshell, people probably think I'm a bit of a lunatic. I just explained that it's not a great place to invest, but that's not the case. Uh, in reality, it's a wonderful place uh, to invest. Um, part of the, the, the issues that cause the, 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 the problems that I just highlighted of being a place that, that is incredibly wealthy um, but doesn't have a lot of the bases of a full economy is where the opportunities are. We have uh, inefficiencies, we have um, a market that is not tapped, we have incredible growth. Um, you know, uh, it's not, it's nowhere on the level obviously of some of the BRIC countries, but I think that's worked to our advantage. Um, one of the, if I could just pick up on the lessons, one of the most important lessons that I've sort of picked out of the BRICS countries and how it would apply to somewhere like Saudi Arabia is too fast growth is not necessarily a great thing all the time. It, it erodes all of the social fiber of a nation, uh, traditional values you lose, social issues that rise as a, a result of, of dramatic change. Um, and sometimes it's, it's nicer to be lucky than smart, and we found ourselves quite lucky developing along with the pace of oil. N now, with that said, that's happened. Um, we're we, we're in, uh, in an incredible boom time. Um, we need to now channel that as a nation, both private and public, into uh, creating a, a diverse economy outside of the oil and gas sector. Um, there are opportunities there. We're very lucky we have government willingness. Um, we have private sector willingness, although not as willing as government, I don't think, just yet. Um, and we have you know, people looking at us now. This kind of discussion is, is highlighting the fact that people are interested in these emerging markets, which may be, you know, and you know, definition, frontier, it's a tough place to be. It's a tough neighborhood. Um, my father used to always say that three of the greatest religions on earth were all sent to the same part of the world. And if God can't make us listen, then, you know, it, it's obviously a difficult group of people to deal with. Um, but that notwithstanding, I think it's a wonderful place to invest at the moment. There's lots of opportunities, and I'm sure we'll get into it as a result of uh, the discussion going forward. 
Thank you. So Liu Lengo, let me finish with you. Can you talk a little bit from China's point of view? Are these frontier nations competitors or will China work in a cooperative, uh, complementary way? Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you you very much. First of all, I would like to briefly introduce you our understanding of frontier market. I think they have some common features. First, in recent years, they enjoyed very rapid growth rate, about 6% GDP growth. Some countries even enjoy 10% of GDP growth rate. But however, their development status is still very prim primitive. For example, in investment environment, all the uh, other business this climate are yet to be further improved. Secondly, they all have their advantages. They all have their very strong willingness to develop. And also, they need international cooperation and foreign aid. Uh, so for those frontier markets, for example, uh, in terms of the resource, in terms of the reform, they have very strong willingness and commitment and they start, they carry out some big initiatives, but they need international cooperation. They need very good international support. That's very important. And thirdly, in terms of the market, they have a big potential to, to develop. However, they, ha they still have a huge uncertainties, or sometimes we call it a risky factor. So from the banker's perspective, we want to manage risk. No risk, no returns. So I fully agree with the um, <coughs> The speaker said, you have to assume you have to take certain risk. Otherwise, you can hardly call those markets as a frontier markets. So after three decades of reform, I think in China, one thing we learned that those frontier markets are will be the future trend of the globalization. And this kind of trend is a fair trend and they will provide opportunities for us to improve the livelihoods of the people and also redistribution of the global wealth which is a very necessary trend to improve the livelihoods of people in other regions so if you look at those countries those frontier markets or countries they have their own unique situations there is no uh, one size fits all solutions to follow so and third point is from chinese experiences we believe in our past development we uh, gained some very important insights and lessons. For example, how could we focus more on environmental protection in the process of development? How could we uh, achieve more inclusive and equitable growth to minimize the income gap between the rich and the poor? So China's Exim Bank as a official window for foreign aid in China, we are always working to provide foreign aid services to different countries and regions. So we're working hard to expand our services. We, yeah, of course, we're faced always with risks. But in the long run, our judgment is no risk, no returns. We should collaborate together. Risk can be managed, can be minimized. We can through all kinds of innovation of products, services, of financial restructuring to provide a tailor-made pro products and services to those countries and provide better financial services to promote mutual development. Thank you. Of getting the balance, uh, getting uh, from from growth, but all in transformation, but also getting the social balance, environmental balance. First, kind of when you look across the uh, the universe of emerging markets, who's actually doing it right and who has the biggest problems? Oh, that's a that's a tough one. Um, I think uh, something that uh, perhaps uh, perhaps it was uh, Khalid who said uh, that there is a sense in which there is a there is a growth rate that might be too fast. Uh, I think that's something that has not been explored enough in the uh, in the policy space. Um, 
And by not export enough, what I mean by, by that is we always celebrate a higher GDP growth rate as being intrinsically better uh, without accounting for the full um, environmental cost, if you will, if you use the term environmental in a very liberal sense to include all sorts of societal costs. Um, Khaled, I think, was speaking about um, um, the cost imposed in the fabric of society, which is an even more abstract notion of cost. But even if we confine ourselves to carbon price, for instance, or various kinds of carbon footprint type issues, those are costs that certainly are not factored into most GDP calculations. Um, there, is a, there is a stream of, um, uh, of work pushed by, um, uh, by some World Bank economists and even some philosophers, including one of my teachers, Amartya Sen, at Harvard, um, where they compute this human development index, uh, which is an alternative characterization of the development of societies. And those HDI, so-called HDI rankings, are often quite different from, uh, from uh, GDP rankings. Um, uh, the U.S., for instance, shrinks pretty far away from the top when you begin to, when you begin to look at uh, its, uh, its ranking in terms of human development index, so to speak. Um, so I think my answer would be that depending on what aspect of progress uh, a particular society chooses to prioritize, uh, you would get very different answers for what's an appropriate GDP growth rate. Uh, for my own taste, you know, anything south of, for these sorts of markets, anything south of seven is probably too low, but anything north of ten is probably imposing some dramatic costs on everybody else. Uh, but I'm sure we'd get different views from, uh, from across the table. Yeah. Other people have views on, on this? So I um, I agree totally on, 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 on uh, the numbers, but one of the interesting discussions that I've had in the last few days was with a, a friend of mine who works for a bank, and his bank ran the numbers on um, their most successful companies that they've invested in. He runs an investment bank. And the average long-term growth rate was 2.3%. Now, I don't know anyone in this room or any other room would, would invest in a company if they told you its, it's growth was going to be at 2.3% for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting discussion. I don't know w where one would start looking at it. Um, and I think it comes back down to one of the themes of, of uh, this year's event that um, mm. w you know, we've heard said again and again, but quality, quality growth, growth yes. versus just growth. And that does take into account then the environment, the abstract ideas, um, and it, it, it means the numbers can be looked at where 2.3%, whatever it may be, may not be such a bad number when you look at some of the other features around it. Um, in, in Vietnam, is, that, is this an issue of debate? Do people debate how to have healthy growth uh, and to deal with the environmental uh, and social effects of growth, or is that, are you concentrating on growth at the moment? Uh, in Vietnam, it's uh, our growing. It's it's uh, 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 we not pay only, uh, only attention about growing. We are uh, now pay a, a lot of attention about our social uh, problem for sustainable uh, growth of the country. Uh, and uh, uh, the last time, our government pay uh, start to pay more attention about the uh, environment issues. Uh, which is related to the economy uh, growth. Uh, and Vietnam is not uh, alone on that. We are, we are, as a member of ASEAN, mm -hmm. you know, uh, together with the other uh, 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 member countries of the, of the ASEAN, we have a, a policy of uh, sustainable growth in, in, in the regions. Mm -hmm. Do you have a comment on that? <laughs> Well, yes, yes, I agree with uh, the, the panelists, but, uh, you know, uh, when you look at, at my, my country, Azerbaijan, it used to be uh, the fastest growing economy in the world. And uh, like three, uh, maybe four years ago, it was uh, growth, uh, it was GDP growth, it was about 35% uh, per annum. Is it good or bad? Actually, it, it depends on how, uh, how, you, how do you use it. And uh, let's say uh, the main uh, point of our growth, it was uh, oil and gas. And uh, the, uh, the question is, how uh, do we use it, this growth just 
in terms of uh, oil and gas, it's just benefiting from oil and gas, and how uh, you use it just to develop the rest of the country, I mean, the, the non-oil sector. How do you deal with the uh, you know, environment and uh, other uh, issues? It's, uh, I think it's uh, very important. And in uh, an example of, uh, let's say, <coughs> Azerbaijan, uh, despite of the fact that uh, we are uh, originally uh, uh, oil and gas rich uh, country, and, uh, but uh, our government uh, pays a lot of attention for the renewables, uh, for, uh, for uh, alternative uh, sources of, uh, of energy. Right, I'd now like to start to tap into the wisdom in the audience and to get questions from the audience for our, our panel. Uh, people have mics around, so please uh, raise your hand. Yes, first question there on the left-hand side. Hi. I'm Pranay Agarwal. I represent a fast-growing company in India. Um, this question relating to the countries that are more resource-rich. Uh, leaving the resource and real estate in these countries, what are the other sectors do you think we should be looking to invest uh, to get returns? Hmm. Who'd like to take that one? Khalid, yes. <coughs> uh, well, as far as Saudi Arabia, um, education, healthcare, those are one, both required. Um, I think Saudi Arabia is an interesting case because the if you look at last year's budget, which was our largest budget in history, about $200 billion, $190 billion-ish, 50% um, of that went into education, healthcare, uh, resource de well, human resource development. Um, and that's a huge amount being uh, plowed into the, the, that economy by uh, government. Um, that in itself is an incredible opportunity if anyone wants to invest uh, in various markets in somewhere like Saudi. And bear in mind all of the ancillary um, markets that would develop from this, whether it's in IT, whether it's in um, service-based industries. Uh, our, our growth in Saudis is literally based on necessity. If we don't uh, grow, if we don't build various industries, we'll, we'll die and wither. I mean, the population of uh, Riyadh in 1950 was 50,000 families. Today it's over 6 million people. Um, and the, the country is not built to sustain that kind of population. We have no water, very basic. So oil is our water and if, if we don't develop everything else then we have no, no life without water. Um, so what I would say if you're looking to invest almost anything can grow. Uh, Apart from agriculture, I wouldn't recommend <laughs> investing in agriculture. Was that if you have yes, another and, uh, I, would, uh, I would add uh, agriculture uh, for sure. Uh, you know, uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, uh, we have uh, nine out of twelve uh, climatic zones just in one country, and with uh, very good traditions uh, uh, in agriculture, in growing uh, cotton, tobacco, and wheat. So I think uh, the uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, just sector just to uh, to invest in would be agriculture. Okay. Other questions? Yes, in the front row. Can we get a, a mic to the front row, please? Thank you. Uh, I just had a. My name is Kumar I'm from a company called Sutherland. Uh, one of the things that uh, I didn't hear the panel across, you know, or everybody talk about is, is about talent, mm -hmm. about people. Uh, you may have resources or you may need, uh, or you may have opportunities. Uh, you may have, of course, challenges about visas and immigrations in some countries. You may want to have the right balance in terms of you know, domestic people to whom you want to bring on board uh, from across uh, other places. But between what's happening in India of, of being people being there, but of course not hireable, and maybe a lot of opportunity to train people. Uh, to uh, you know, uh, people of course available again, you know, in China, but maybe for more for manufacturing and not services. On the other hand, uh, and, and the push for services, but of course, can people be available to places like Saudi Arabia, where you're talking of education and training? But the point here is, of course, what is the kind of employment opportunity? What kind of training? 
where is it that we can actually play and bring the right kind of balance across all these different people? Different I, I, think, I think it's a, a great and important question. No, I, uh, we should start, uh, start first. Question. The question about talent. And, so China is developing very quickly, and we have realized that it takes time for us to nurture a new generation of talents and develop education. We have realized that education is the most important engine for development. So Chinese experience have already showed that talents and skilled workers are very important in the construction of roads and highways and so on. So when the workers are trained and when they get experience in the construction uh, sites in China, so they can bring, they can take their experience to other countries when they go overseas. So. We find that it's very important for us to have technology transfer, and it's also important for us to have the talent transfer. We, I think that in the, uh, in the, the frontier countries, I think this is a very good experience for them borrow. They need to nurture the new generation of talents. And as a potential failure point. Uh, so I, I think that was an excellent, excellent question. Um, uh, you know, in, in one, way, one way of looking at this is that in, in a large country like India, almost, uh, depending on how uncharitable you want to be, 400 to 500 million people are just completely locked out of the uh, mainstream economy. Um, and this is the ultimate emerging market within the emerging market in the sense that the supply of talent at one level is so enormous and the demand is also there because you always find corporations complaining about attrition and lack of hireable workers and so on but you have no shortage of intrinsic talent it's just the matching process the market for talent is not working so it's the ultimate expression of an emerging market within an emerging market uh, and to go to the uh, previous question which is what are the investment opportunities whether in resource rich countries or not uh, I think talent is the ultimate investment opportunity, uh, whether in Saudi Arabia or in China or in India. If you can get this allocation of talent within the country to be done even marginally better, uh, I'd wager that that goes straight to the bottom line in terms of a uh, country's improvement and prospects. So this is probably the most uh, uh, important economic issue as well as the most important humanitarian issue at some level for the development of a country. Yeah. Any other comments on this? Yes. Can I just say, uh, you know, in Saudi Arabia, um, which was obviously specifically referred to, uh, I agree with you. It's a very big issue. Uh, getting talent into the country, local talent is a big issue. As a, uh, Under our holding companies, we run five separate companies that are in, in different industries. And I can tell you it's very difficult to get talent, um, locally and from abroad. But we have an issue is that the labor force in Saudi Arabia is between 7 and 8 million people. 80% of that is foreign. Um, 90, just under 90% of the Saudi labor force works in government. So there are very few Saudis in the private sector. And it's the biggest issue we face. It's not dissimilar to many countries that try to nurture an industry by blocking out the competitors. Um, at some stage you have to, otherwise you'll drown out your own country, uh, you'll drown out your own people, you won't give them the opportunity. I mean, in my opinion, we have 10% male unemployment in Saudi Arabia, which is actually also missing a big issue. Um, I'm not sure how much female unemployment we have in Saudi Arabia, which is a, it's a cost to the country. 40% um, of people between 15 and 26 are unemployed. And that's another scary number. But we have six and a half million foreign workers. To me, that says we don't have a jobs issue. We have a talent issue. Um, and sometimes we need to bite the bullet and say, look, we're going to have to hold back our private industry. We're going to have to hold back growth so that we can nurture this talent. And I, you know, the number one lessons to learn from India, China, um, Russia, etc., particularly India and China. I mean, I think they've done a phenomenal job of fostering talent in the last 40 years. David, uh, David Bain in the middle. Uh, 
Thank you. Thanks. I'm David Michael with BCG. Um, Prince Ben Sultan talked about winning the lottery, and I think a lot of small emerging countries have been winning the lottery lately with commodity prices booming. And so many of these countries are maybe taking a double bet with their economic development. They're betting on high commodity prices. They're also betting on the continued strength of China, which is driving a lot of the commodity exports. And it highlights the more general question of how do you decide as your economies develop where you benefit from China versus where you compete and what kind of balanced economic development you pursue. So I wonder gentlemen from different uh, markets might comment upon how they manage that balance and how they decide where to compete with versus benefit from China and how to balance different sectors of their economies. It's a great question. Shall we start with Vietnam? How do you compete with China? How do you cooperate with China? Uh, Vietnam and China has a, a long history of uh, cooperation. Uh, our development uh, today is uh, it's, uh, it's a fruit of, of that long cooperation. So uh, now they uh, you not, we not only all cooperate with China, we really compete with China. And uh, what is our uh, point of view of competing with China? Uh, we uh, are trying to uh, avoid uh, the strength of the Chinese uh, market. It's what it's, it's, it's uh, 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 cheap labor forces with, uh, with uh, a cheap uh, product. And to avoid that, uh, Vietnam has have a policy to uh, invest more and to uh, attract more investment in the in the more high uh, high uh, quality product. Uh, say uh, I take maybe for, for clear time I take an example, but the, the apparel, uh, textile and apparel, Vietnam and China is is uh, two biggest uh, uh, pro exporter of that of that product. But uh, Vietnam concentrated in 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 the medium, uh, in medium uh, uh, quality uh, uh, product, and uh, was uh, quite successful last time. Last time with that product. And the China factor for Azerbaijan. Actually, maybe it is crazy just to compete with China, but uh, <laughs> to cooperate with China, of course. And uh, actually. Uh, I wouldn't be mistaken if uh, if I say that uh, many uh, goods, uh, let's say to to Azerbaijan, to uh, this part of the world, um, come from China, or, uh, produced in China, manufactured in China, and at the same time, how can we benefit uh, from uh, cooperating with uh, China? I think uh, just exporting uh, our goods and uh, products uh, to China. And just recently, we had. Uh, I just mentioned agriculture, and uh, maybe uh, from China, China's scale, it is uh, not, not a big volume, but uh, for, for us, for such country as, as Azerbaijan, let's say uh, exporting uh, tobacco, uh, which is actually uh, Azerbaijan started uh, to produce uh, to China, it, it would be of our a big benefit. Your bank must be financing a lot of Chinese companies going on that commodities hunt as well. Uh, I believe actually different countries, they all have their own different uh, advantages. So that's what we call comparative advantages. So if we have a similar industrial structures, for example, if we all have the advantages in low quality, uh, cheap products or cheap labors, what should we do? For example, in the past, we actually, we have already witnessed some fierce competition in terms of the labor fight. For example, in Europe, you have all the holidays and the weekends, and restaurants will close, will be closed during the weekends. But in China, we op we're open. This is a cultural differences. However, once you reach a certain development stage, you will find your uh, appropriate 
way or development approach. For example, in today's China, we already realized that coastal city have to transfer certain manufacturing base or certain in sectors into inland cities. So now we realize that our top priority should be how could we tap on our development experiences to transfer those development knowledge, development approach, and to provide training to the labor, local laborers in other countries. If local residents cannot benefit, that will not be sustained. So we need a cooperation. I want to twist his question to something that I think is perhaps even a bit more interesting, which is when a country does win a lottery, like a commodity boom, the question is, what does it do with that money? Um, you know, Chile, for instance, is, has created this very nice, I think it's uh, Velasco is the finance minister, who maybe is one of the engineers of this, has created a very nice stabilization fund where the boom, part of the boom money automatically goes into a fund that's used for, uh, the feast is used to prepare for the famine that inevitably will, will show up eventually. Um, and that, that's, that I think is just a very profound thing because it's a way of restraining uh, the current generation from excess uh, for the benefit of the future generation. And most countries are not able to do it. Uh, you know, Khalid was talking about earlier about having won the lottery um, with the oil gusher and uh, experiencing extraordinary difficulty in the kingdom with developing all sorts of other industries. And that's true not just of Saudi, but of all, uh, many of the uh, oil-rich uh, oil -rich countries and many of the uh, resource-rich countries in, uh, in Africa. They've not been able to uh, take, the, take, the, take the lottery money and convert it into infrastructure that can then generate new industries, uh, which ultimately will, of course, be a much more robust base. So I think when these lotteries arise, I guess the question for all of us is, uh, what can one do to channel those funds into productive, longer-term institutional development, which by and large does not seem to happen, which is why I think the few experiments that do exist on this are extraordinarily useful to look at and study. I just add a, a yeah. quick uh, uh, point about some of the, the resource-rich countries and some of the difficulty they've gone through, and this lottery issue is um, you know, we're looking to develop and catch up to China and India, um, but we behave like America and Japan as a nation and inside the nation. And this is one of the fundamental difficulties we have in taking things forward. It's why we have 80% of our labor force foreign. Um, we have plenty of people to build roads that are Saudi. They just don't want to do it. Um, and uh, you know this is the major challenge for the the resource rich countries particularly when it's based on one research we're not we're not talking about brazil which has a number of things to choose from um, so we you know the, the the generation in saudi arabia and, and many of the gulf states that grew up in genuine poverty is almost long gone those of us who have been born now who talk about it in a, a nostalgic way don't know anything about it and i think this is the danger so thank you in the, on the side, please. Yeah, there's a question for Mr. Sultan. My name is Udeshi from India. Uh, Saudi economy is, uh, I believe, over dependent on two products, basically oil and gas. So the economy is dependent on oil prices. At $100, the economy is at a different stage, and at $40, it will be at a different stage. So uh, that is one, one of the vulnerability of the resources uh, which are having uh, um, Middle Eastern country, number one. And the number two issue would be, as and when the resources starts getting depleted, how are we going to cope up with the situation on the economy, on the growth, on the people? Mm -hmm. I think this is going to be the biggest challenge for uh, mm -hmm. countries like Saudi or Kuwait or Middle Eastern country. Thank, Thank you. You. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, if 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 I, I, I'm uh, I don't know whether it would be optimistic or pessimistic. Um, I rather believe that oil has become less of an issue before it runs out, um, and I think technologies will develop um, before the oil runs out, long before. Um, some of the numbers one hears <coughs> about uh, the reserves, I think, are 
overstated by some and understated by others. The truth is usually somewhere in the middle. Uh, but if oil ran out tomorrow, or wasn't important tomorrow, I can tell you Saudi Arabia would be in a very, very serious issue, um, as will, would most of the Gulf states. Um, we, we, we're nowhere near where we need to be um, in terms of not just the economy, but it is the development of the people socially, etc. cetera. In, uh, you know, people always talk about political change. Um, in, in the Middle East, etc. We're nowhere near ready for political change. And the reason we're not ready for political change is because we don't have, we don't have a, a sustainable economy that can you know, live through the rigors of a more open society. Now, I know some people won't like the way that sounds, but you, you need to direct a country that has the situation that it's in today. It, it can't be left um, rudderless, essentially, for periods of time when there's squabbling going on. Now, there are a lot of negatives with that that are associated with not having an opposition party, not having, but it's it's a much more open consensus-based system than than um, than one thinks. And I think China is a great example of where um, a directed growth benefited the country significantly. Singapore is another great example. Um, countries that have a lot of, lot of hard work in a very short amount of time need someone to lead the country, not someone to follow where the country is going, particularly when the country is not going anywhere. Thank you. Uh, when I think about the question of beyond BRICS, it, it seems to me that one of the biggest growth vectors that you could have is to trade amongst each other. And that trades, you know, what, what is people talking about, South-South trading and so on. And yet the numbers are still staggeringly low. I mean, actually, the orientation of financial institutions towards the West, you just keep hearing about you know, China, Chinese banks wanting to go to Europe or the States, and the similar case in, in many different industries. What is holding it back? Or is there a fundamental reason why you know, Azerbaijan isn't selling tobacco to Vietnam, and Vietnam isn't selling to Saudi Arabia in much bigger numbers? Great question. Why don't we start with uh, uh, Vice President Liu, all your busy experience at the ADB and also in the Import Export Bank might be very, very useful here. I think the key issue here is, first of all, if you look at the big picture, in terms of the historical development, no, no, when we talk about the trade development and investment development, it all happens among the major economies, no matter it's about G7 or BRIC countries. If we look at about 10 years ago, China's trade volume was very small, much smaller than what we have today. So we need time. We need to develop a market. Secondly, currently, South South collaboration, they have their own challenges. We need some breakthroughs here. For example, in China, we have our we had some experiences here. When we need uh, foreign investment, when we need to grant some benefits to foreign investors, we had a huge national debate on that. So, in order to gain the development, you have to pay pay first. No pay, no gain. So, uh, for example, in those frontier markets, I believe you also have those kind of policy debates. How could you open up your market? And this is a very complex uh, task. So I think real terms collaboration is the key to solve those challenges. Um, it's a very good point. And uh, the last few days being here, I can't tell you the amount of people who who have come up and said, why aren't you investing in China? And why isn't China investing in Saudi? I mean, there is investment that goes back and forth. But um, if it makes you feel any better, if, it, if it's, again, more optimistic, uh, when I leave here, I'm next week meeting with a bunch of people to figure out ways how we can do this outside of, of um, the, the manic uh, pace of somewhere like the World Economic Forum. Um, and there, there are significant barriers to entry on both sides, of, uh, on all sides. Uh, from Saudi Arabia, you know, it's, there's an image issue, the perception of Saudi Arabia, the security 
of one's investment in a country like Saudi Arabia. Um, and when I say an image, these are not real. Um, there is some very significant, there are some very significant um, real issues which are uh, regulatory and legal. Uh, it's very easy for Saudis to keep their money in Saudi, not so easy for foreigners. Um, people don't know what will happen, how do they uh, arbitrate uh, um, um, arguments even, not, doesn't even need to go into uh, serious legal issues. Um, we, we have um, no real mechanism to receive a lot of investment. Even though I think Saudi Arabia ranks somewhere um, around 15 on the largest receiver, recipient of foreign direct investment. But obviously it's channeled into very obvious areas in the oil and gas industry. Um, I, I would love to see, you know, ties built based on investment. It was a policy that His Majesty King Abdullah in 2005 tried to encourage. I, I know because I was one of the, I worked in the foreign office at the time when they were trying to push it. Um, build ties together, not just invest in each other's countries. I think it's the best thing. Uh, the, the developing world more united is, is much better than developing world competing against each other. Thanks. Professor Khanna. Uh, so I would, uh, um, I'd push back a little on that characterization, actually, because I think it's a little bit of whether you see a glass as half full or half empty. Uh, the ratio of um, any South-South statistic to total uh, inter-country statistic has risen, you know, a fair amount in the last 10 years. Uh, it's small. Uh, it's maybe 10 percent or 15 percent of the total volume of any cross-border trade but it's not one or two percent that it used to be. Or to put it in a more uh, practical way, uh, you know, when I was a student uh, 20 years ago, um, it would be, uh, I, you know, I teach, at, uh, I teach at the Harvard Business School, and it would be almost impossible for one of our instructors to tell us that you could build, you know, a company from zero to a billion dollars uh, without going to New York or London. It would just not be possible. And uh, today, it's, uh, if not routine, it's certainly not uncommon. I can think of any number of companies sitting here that, that are built between Sao Paulo and Beijing, uh, Kuala Lumpur and, uh, you know, pick a southeast, you know, pick a Johannesburg, uh, Bombay and Abu Dhabi. Uh, there are billion dollar companies that didn't exist, you know, uh, two years ago, three years ago, and nobody ever went to London or New York. And that's a South-South transaction, if, uh, if ever there was one. And I dare say you'll see a lot more of that. So I think uh, you're, you're, the question is a fantastic one. Uh, but I just don't know. I, I, I would prefer to see that glass is half full than half empty. Yeah. Thank you all very much. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. We have learned that the frontier is a rough place, but also a place with many opportunities. Please join me in thanking the panel.